Hi, welcome back to this chapter eight of the Little Book of Valuation. I've called this chapter Valuation Viagra for a reason. It's about valuing mature companies. And mature companies are like middle-aged people. They try to be young again. Consequently, they often overshoot. They try too hard to be young again and spend incredible amounts of money in the process. So let's talk about the challenges of valuing mature companies. In many ways, valuing mature companies should be easy to do, right? They have long histories, they've established business models. So you think, what can be the problem? The first is growth has leveled off, right? Revenue growth is low, so that's what makes the mature companies. The margins are established, this is good news. But if you look across mature companies, they can be a wildly varied bunch. Some can have no competitive advantages, some can have a little competitive advantage, some can have significant competitive advantages. So when you think about mature companies, don't assume that they don't have any competitive advantages. There are mature companies with immense competitive advantages and those mature, and there are other mature companies with none of them. So that becomes a key factor in valuation, is what kind of barriers to entry has this company built up over time. You'll also notice some financial commonalities across mature companies. They're more likely to use debt. And the question of how much debt to take becomes a more critical question determining value. And they're also more likely to be returning cash, both in the form of dividends and in the U.S. in the form of buybacks. One final point, as revenue growth levels off and mature companies see growth dropping off, Remember I talked about trying too hard. Some of these mature companies are going to try to grow again through acquisitions. By itself, acquisitions are just like any other investment, but they can create difficulties when valuing these companies because acquisitions tend to be lumpy. So you're not going to be able to see them as smoothly as you do traditional investments over time. Now, when you think about valuation and pricing issues, mature companies, the first, I think, challenge and especially when you're doing pricing, you have too many choices. You say, what does that even mean? Remember we talked about how when you price things, you have to scale to a variable. With the young growth companies, you had no choice but to scale to revenues. With mature companies, you have all kinds of choices. You can use revenues, you can use EBITDA, you can use operating income, you can use net income, you can use book value. And sometimes, because of all these choices, you can price the same mature company using six or seven different scalars and get very different estimates of the pricing. Second, when you price or value a mature company, you are making an assumption about who's going to be running the company. You're always making that assumption with any company. The mature company here is why it matters. To the extent that a mature company is run by a management that you don't think is quite up to the task, the value that you get for this company, assuming the existing management runs a company, will be lower than if somebody else ran the company. You might still say, so what? If there's a chance that somebody else could run the company, either because of an acquisition or an activist investor putting challenging the company, well, that's got to be factored in the chance that management will change. We talked about acquisitions and the noise it creates in valuations, not just in terms of the jumps it can create in reinvestment. Every three or four years, you can have a big reinvestment in the form of an acquisition. But in terms of the accounting debris that comes with acquisitions, goodwill, it throws off your return on capital. Impairment of goodwill can affect your earnings. Things can make things that can create more opacity in how you think about a company. And finally, as I said, debt is something that mature companies can use. Some might choose not to use it, in which case you have to ask the question, what will happen to the value of the company? They choose to go out and borrow money, and especially if they have the capacity to do so. So those are issues you're more likely to run into with mature companies. So let's think about how you would confront dealing with those issues. Let's take the question of management change. What is the effect of changing the management of the company on the operating assets or the operating? There is an operating restructuring effect that you can think about. But to kind of bring it to brass tacks, here's what I would suggest. Operating restructuring can take dozens of potential actions, but ultimately it's got to show up in one of three numbers or one or more of three numbers. First, it can show up in terms of the cash flows from the existing assets. If you are more efficient about the way you produce goods, you should be able to generate more cash flows, higher margins from existing assets, cost cutting, more efficient operations. 
The second is operating restructuring can also show up as better value from growth. Notice how I phrased it, not as a higher growth rate necessarily. And here's why it's not always higher growth that creates higher value. If you're in a good business earning more than your cost of capital, then improving your growth, reinvesting a little bit more will increase value. But if you're in a bad business earning less than your cost of capital, cutting back on reinvestment, going for less growth can actually increase your value. So operating restructuring can take the form of cost cutting, efficient operations, higher cash flows from existing assets, higher value from growth. And in some cases, it can come from rediscovering competitive advantages, barriers to entry that will allow you to go back to being not a really high growth company, but at least a growth company for a brief period. So lengthen out the growth period. So things you can do to improve your operations can increase value. With mature companies, you also have the potential for financial restructuring. If you think about financial restructuring, it's really about the question of how is this company funded? Ultimately, there are only two ways you can fund a business, debt and equity. The big difference between the two is debt is a contractual, gives rise to contractual cash flows. Equity is a residual cash flow. On the other side of the balance sheet, of course, you've got assets in place. In a mature company, the bulk of the value comes from assets in place and growth assets. But if you think in terms of the debt versus equity trade-off, the costs and benefits of debt are relatively straightforward. The biggest single benefit of debt, and let me re repeat that again, the biggest single benefit of debt is a tax benefit. Interest is tax deductible, but cash flows to equity are not. That is in fact the biggest advantage of borrowing money is it can lower your cost of capital because of that tax advantage. There's a secondary benefit, at least at companies where managers own relatively few shares. To the extent that those managers are going to be sloppy and take bad projects, borrowing money can make them more disciplined. So you've got tax benefit, added discipline. On the other side, debt creates a, has a dark side. The first is by borrowing money, increase your chance of defaulting, of going bankrupt. You say, what if I'm a large mature company? For every company, borrowing money will increase that likelihood of defaulting, maybe from 0.1 to 1%, but it will always increase. That increased risk of bankruptcy can, translates into a bankruptcy cost. The second reason debt creates a, a consequence is it creates a, a claim holder with a very different claim. Lenders want guaranteed cash flows. Equity investors will get what's left over. So lenders will push off in a different direction than equity investors, and it plays out as agency costs in the company. Higher you know, interest rates, maybe more restrictive covenants when you borrow money. It's that trade-off that will determine whether you should borrow money or not. Now, to make this practical in a, in, a, in a mature company, you can compute the cost of capital for the company at different debt ratios. Starting at no debt, working all your way up to 90% debt. You think that's going to be easy, just change the weights in my cost of equity and debt. It's not that straightforward. As you borrow more money, you change your cost of equity. Equity becomes riskier and you also change the cost of debt. Cost of debt will also go up because there's higher default risk. But you are replacing, when you borrow more money, more expensive capital equity with less expensive capital. Now I'll give you an example. The company I am using as my lab experiment for this chapter is a company called Unilever. It's a UK-based company, a consumer product company with some very well-known brand names. So one of the things I wanted to examine is how much potential debt capacity does Unilever have? Right now, Unilever is about 17% debt, 83% equity. And I want to say, could their cost of capital decrease if they went to a higher or a lower debt ratio? So I computed the cost of capital at every debt ratio from 0 to 90%. Now, here's the reason I'm able to do it. Remember when we talked about beta, we talked about how beta is affected by how much you borrow. As you borrow more money, your beta goes up. I've computed the beta for Unilever at every debt ratio from 0 to 90%. And you can see that as I get to higher and higher debt ratios, my beta increases. Equity is riskier. And as my beta goes up, my cost of equity goes up. Now, as I borrow money, my default risk is also going to go up. The way I compute the cost of debt is by computing what's called the, remember the synthetic ratings process I described in an earlier chapter? I use that synthetic ratings process to estimate the cost of debt at every debt ratio. No surprises again. 
as I get to higher and higher debt ratios, my cost of debt goes up, both before and after taxes. In fact, at very high tax rates, I might even lose my capacity to borrow as much because my tax advantage is decreased. So my cost of debt after taxes, my cost of equity, both increases, my debt ratio goes up. Early on though, as I borrow money, my cost of capital decreases. Remember I said the current debt ratio is 16.8%. The cost of the optimal debt ratio for uh, Unilever seems to be about 20%. What does that tell me? Basically Unilever has about the right amount of debt for them as a company. Now, of course, that's not going to be true for all mature companies. For some mature companies, you might find that their actual debt ratio is much lower than the optimal. Don't do anything crazy and value them using the target or an optimal yet, but at least it'll give you a sense of if somebody else came in and ran the company, could they lower the cost of capital by borrowing more money? So the first dimension you look at when you look at debt is, does this company have enough debt? Does it, has it borrowed as much as it can afford to given its tax rates and given its operating income? Now, the other aspect of debt that can sometimes affect the value of a company is, have you mismatched your debt? What does that mean? One of the first principles in corporate finance is you want to match your debt up to your assets. If your assets are long term, you want your debt to be long term. If your assets are in dollars or produce cash flows in dollars, you want your debt to be in, in dollars as well. If you mismatch your debt, you increase your default risk as a company, which raises your cost of debt and your cost of capital. So for a company, one of the ways in which you might be able to lower your cost of capital without borrowing an additional dollar is by changing your debt to make it match up better to your assets. You're saying, how am I going to do that? Well, you can take new financing for new projects in a way that moves you towards where you'd like to be. So if you're a company with a lot of European projects with the cash flows in euros and no euro debt now, on the next few projects, you might disproportionately use euro debt to move towards that mix you want. You will also live in a world where you have swaps and derivatives that you can use to kind of move your debt from where it is today to where you'd like it to be. And to the extent that you can use hedges to kind of fix mismatches. So if you have a lot of dollar debt and your cash flows are in, are in Singapore dollars or in Japanese yen, you can use hedges to kind of protect yourself against that mismatch. But both changing the debt ratio and reducing mismatch shows up as a lower cost of capital and potentially a higher value. One final stop to consider when you think about is there anything else I can do as a mature company to raise my value? And you know, all firms have non-operating assets. Those non-operating assets can be either cash and marketable securities or holdings in other companies. With cash, the rule in valuation is pretty simple. Just take the cash balance and add it on. But let me raise what I think could be a provocative question. Let's say you have a company, a mature company with a billion dollars in cash. It is conceivable that markets looking at the billion dollars might discount the cash in the hands of this company. Not because it earns a low rate of return. Because cash, even though it earns a low rate of return, earns a fair rate of return. It's in liquid and close to riskless investments. It's because you don't trust the managers with your cash. You say, why wouldn't I trust them? Because of their history. If you're a mature company that a history of doing bad acquisitions, taking bad investments, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to preemptively assume you're going to continue to do that and discount the cash. So cash can be discounted because I don't trust you as a manager. Now do you see why somebody else running the company could very quickly unlock value? All they have to do is come in and return the cash to you. The minute you return the cash, the discount disappears. So with cash, there is that potential, at least with some companies, that it's being discounted in your hands. What about cross holdings? Cross holdings are holdings in other companies that are very difficult to deal with in valuation because they're messy. And because they're messy, they can sometimes be undervalued because they're complex and tough to value. They can also be un, you know, discounted because, again, you don't trust management of the company. Notice how with mature companies, trusting management can affect the value that you attach to things because those managers control your cash and often control the cross holdings that the company has. And this is why management changes can affect value. So think about all the things we've talked about from operating restructuring to changing your debt ratio to changing the type of debt to the fact that cash and cross holdings might be discounted and then follow through. Here's what you can do. 
you can value the company with the existing management in place. What does that mean? Might, they might be running their the assets inefficiently. They might not be borrowing money. They might so in a sense keep that in place. If they don't borrow money, even though they can afford to, the status quo valuation leave them with the status quo. And the cash is being discounted. Leave it in there. Come up with the status quo value for the company. Then revalue the company with somebody else running the company. Somebody optimal running the company. You say, what does that mean? Well, you might replace the company's current margins, which are low because the existing management is inefficient with the industry average margins. You might move their debt ratio from the actual debt ratio to the optimal. And if they have cash and cross holdings that are being discounted, you might decide to give them back to the shareholders. You're going to come up with a new value for the company with the optimal management. And presumably, to the extent that these optimal managers run the company better, you get a higher value. The difference in value is the value per management change. You know what the implication is, right? If you're a company that's already perfectly managed and perfectly run, the value of a management change is zero. In fact, this is what I think about when I think about the value of control. The value of control is zero in an optimally managed, optimally run firm. In a badly managed and badly run firm, it can be huge. Remember, I've, I mentioned Unilever. It's a company that is now a mature company, struggling in a world where its brand names are aging. Now, I valued Unilever with the existing management in place and came up with about 42.44 euros. Its debt ratio is pretty close to optimal. That's not my problem. But it has tried a little too hard trying to do acquisitions, pushing brands to do things that it cannot. And it has some flagging brands that it keeps on, partly because the existing management seems vested in them. Let's assume that a new management can come in prune their brand brand list to make it a more efficient list and improve margins okay? and perhaps even raise the debt ratio slightly not by much to about 30 percent the value that i get with those changes put in is about 49 euros per share you take the difference between the status quo value and the optimal value the value of control in the case of unilever is 6.61 euros per share the difference between the 49.05 and the 42.44. Try this out to a mature company, do a status quo value. You know, and as a caution, there are uh, often analysts get caught up in this target debt ratio or current debt ratio. And my response is when you do a status quo valuation, don't do a target debt ratio. When you do the optimal, by all means, use a target debt ratio, come up with a new value, because that's going to allow you to value control. As I said, let's assume there's a 20% chance of control changing at Unilever, that a new management could come in. I have two values for Unilever, right? 42 with the existing management, 49 with the new management. I now have attached a problem. Let's say, you know, I, you know, an activist investor challenges Unilever. And as a result, you think the probability of change has now risen to 60%. It actually did happen at Unilever. Activists did target it. So this is 60% chance of change, up from 20%. My expected value per share is going to be the 40% times the status quo value plus 60% times the optimal value. The presence, the actual, you know, the, not even the presence, the showing up of an activist investor increases my expected value because it changes the likelihood of change, now of, of the management change. So try that out with your company. And as you will see with mature companies, at first sight, they're relatively simple to value because you have long histories, you have established business models. So do a status quo value first. It's easier to do. But after you've finished your status quo value, then stop and ask these more difficult questions. Is this company well run? Is it, can I change the way it's run? So think in terms of operations, in terms of financing, and then revalue the company with the changes put in and see how much the value of control is in your company. I hope you found the session useful. Thank you very much for listening.